<laughs> Let me have one. Okay, so we've been working on how to read music by number. And uh, since I seem to be the only one in America that's doing this, this is the only place you can learn this. <laughs> you will not find a book or anything anywhere else. And so a few of the books I have read when I was in college on how to read by interval were way too complicated to I, mean, I, I wouldn't even buy the book if, if I weren't already a musician and just did it out of curiosity. The first thing that we learned is that every line in every space on the music staff is labeled <laughs> and we have a pattern that I found comes up over and 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 over again. I'll just tie this up here so you can see that. When you are labeling lines and spaces on the staff, this pattern keeps coming up. And it is the pattern of all the lines or it's the pattern of all the spaces. It works for both. It's every other number. So we have seven numbers in the system. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Or do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Is in solfege. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Which comes from a, we found out it comes from a prayer. Okay. Uh, do was the first uh, syllable of the first uh, measure or stanza of the prayer. Re became the second. Mi was the third. Fa. So actually, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, translated, is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's first measure, second measure, third measure, fourth measure, first stanza, second stanza, third. Yeah. So we have seven notes in the system. And if we skip every other note in the system, a pattern em emerges. One, three, five, seven. So there are four odd numbers. And then we get two, four, and six. So there are three even numbers. So there's an odd number of even numbers and there's an even number of odd numbers. And I like to refer to that as yin-yang. This yin-yang pops up over and over and over and over and over in music because there's seven notes, everything's gonna switch. <laughs> you know, if I start counting with my right hand, one, then go two, three, four, on five, the new one will start with the other side. So if I go right, left, right, left, would be starting the pattern again. And left, right, left, right would be starting an odd pattern again. So anytime you have an odd number, your things are gonna switch from the left to the right or from the right to the left. And in this case, what happens is these numbers going around uh, happen over two octaves. And the reason we chose two octaves is most instruments only have a two octave bandwidth. So here's my little toy saxophone. And my little toy saxophone goes do. And then that's it, I'm out of notes. So I have two octaves on this instrument, that's the bandwidth. A good singer who sings. If I've got a two octave singing bandwidth, I can be a good singer. If I have one octave, I gotta work on it. I gotta stretch it a little. There's a lot of songs that are only one octave wide that I can sing, but one of them is not the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> the Star Spangled Banner is an octave and a half wide, so you have to be a pretty good singer, and that's why. In America, when you hear a group of people sing that anthem, it sounds so damn awful because the average person has a one octave bandwidth. You have to work to get a two octave bandwidth, and here we are singing a song that's our national anthem that requires an operatic diva to kick it out. No wonder, you know, that uh, who was it at the ball game just the other day tried to sing the Star Spangled Banner and did an even worse job than Roseanne? She's now touted as the worst singer. She just a couple, who was it? Not Brittany, but one of those. Yeah. A pop singer got up and sang at a ball game the other day. She was so out of pitch and tune, it was pathetic, and everybody started booing her. Oh. So now, 
I, I can understand this dilemma because if you don't have a two octave range, you can't sing that song. And there are songs like Oh Dandy Boy that actually starts on a low six, goes through one octave, and it goes up to like a high four. So again, it's two octaves wide. Okay? Um, the average saxophone is two octaves and four notes. The, uh, the uh, tuba is uh, two octaves and two notes. Trumpet is 26 notes. That's, uh, there's 24 in two octaves, so that's just two half tones more than two octaves. Again, the range of most instruments is two octaves. So the system that we develop uses five lines and six spaces. Now, I say six spaces, everyone will tell you four. They're wrong, I'm right. The whole world is wrong. There's a reason why they're wrong, and I'll explain it someday. But I can explain what happens when you put the treble clef and the bass clef together. There's always an invisible line that's in the middle that no one's ever been able to explain, which I can't explain. So what we have here is one, two, three, four, five, six spaces, and one, two, three, four, five lines. Five plus six is 11. So I need 15 notes. <coughs> To be, two bit, to be two octaves wide, so 11 is pretty good. And if I add to that what we call ledger lines, if I put one ledger line below the staff and one ledger line above the staff, I now have almost two full octaves. And sometimes with one ledger line below and only one above, I have two octaves plus. Or if I have one below and two above, I'll have two octaves plus. So just by adding these little extra lines, when, they, when I need them as they come up, called ledger lines, I can pretty much, with a single staff, notate the entire bandwidth of any musical instrument. So that is why this, this is a good system. If we made it bigger, there'd be too many lines in your eyeball to get confused. If we make it smaller, it's too small to handle the normal bandwidth of most instruments. So that's why we use this system. And what happens here is this is just simply both a line graph and a bar graph. It's a bar graph when we're reading chords, like a bar graph. It's a line graph from point to point when we're reading melody. So if we think of it as dot, 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 and we're connecting the dots like that, that we call melody. Okay? But if we're building up something like this, what I call snowmen, where we're building it up this way, now it's a bar and it becomes a basically a bar graph. And we have those two elements in music. The harmony, which is always a stack of notes, a bar graph, and then we have the individual melody notes, which go around, which is basically a line graph. What we do here also is the lines and the spaces have equal, equal weight. So what we need to do, as you do with any graph, is you need to know where 0 is or where 1 is. You need to know where the graph starts. If, you're, if I'm calculating something in nuclear physics, and I build what they call a t-bar, usually I have 0 here, and then I have negative numbers here, positive numbers there, and then the timeline goes out this way, and then I can denote how much money I have in the bank or how much I owe the bank, <laughs> and I can look at this graph over a period of several months and actually see how my money's been flowing and where it's been flowing. I can gather information about how I'm spending, right? What's going on in my bank account. Same thing here. We're using this in exactly the same way. But this system visually allows us to put both the bar graph and both the line graph together at the same time. Now we're only going to study melody. We're just looking at melodies to start something. And the first thing we need to know is Where's the zero reference point? Or where's the reference point? The reference point in music we call the key. And traditionally, these, these areas and spaces have been given names based on a thing called the clef. But it turns out it ain't necessary. Don't need them. Don't need to know about the key. Don't need to know what the name is. Not necessary. Okay. Um, so I can make any line or any space anywhere I want the number one. So let's uh, let's do that. And we'll start with A. 
and we'll use this little guy here to help us. What I want to do is I want to use this second line from the bottom as my zero reference point. So what I'm going to do is put an X on that line to mark that line and say this line is 1, the number 1. So if this is the number 1, then this space here is the number 2, then this line here becomes the number 3, that space there becomes the number 4, this line becomes the number 5, this becomes the number 6, this line becomes the number 7, and now that's what we call one octave. 